much. And, and just uh, two um, sort of clarifications. And it's, uh, the, the, the first one is probably entirely our mistake that it's, it's meant to be the waste tech memories. Um, I, I'm sure I, I, I kind of I'm committed that type of when we send in the, the abstract, but uh, this, this, is, this, is, this is the idea. But waster is interesting. I, I, I have to play with that thought. I thought it was ceramics. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and the second one, and again, I, I, I haven't re-looked at the abstract recently, if we mentioned the, the Shabbat <laughs> Exile, which is actually refers to a different film, which we are not screening today, which is incidentally just about to be published in the Journal of Contemporary Archaeology as part of a, 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 of a collaboration, so um, you, you can maybe check that out. But today we are, we are showing you brand new footage, a, a, a completely new film that Vesna has just been literally editing two weeks ago or so. So you're in for three, hopefully. And, and OK, let's just turn off the lights so you can see more. So we would like to start with the film and then do all the talking afterwards. Takes about five minutes. And hopefully it'll work. It worked when we tested it. And I'm going to start. Diese Schiffe waren Ausflugsschiffe, aber nicht zum Boden geeignet. Es gab sechs Kabinen. Eine bekam der Reiseleiter, eine der Schiffsarzt. Die anderen vier wurden als Spitalsräume verwendet. Auf dem Schiff kam es zu einer Umwertung aller Werte. Der begehrteste Besitz war eine Bank im Salon erster Klasse. Ich kann mich nicht mehr erinnern, ob man uns die Plätze zugeteilt oder ob man sie sich erobert oder ersetzen hat. Jedenfalls. Nur die wenigsten konnten auf eine Bank im Salon schlafen. Ein Platz auf dem Fußboden war schon etwas weniger wert, aber auch noch sehr begehrt. Wir, die uns Rache jubeln, waren weg. Dort kommt es auch Bänke. Allerdings nicht mit Sand besucht. Auch der Besitz einer Bank zählte noch etwas, da manche auf dem kalten Boden schlafen müssen. Auch ich hatte nicht einmal eine Bank und ging in der Nacht von einem Platz zum anderen. Das Trinkwasser holte man auf dem Eis der Donau. Fast alle bekamen die Sektorie, Läuse und Skabies. Das Essen bekamen wir vom Land gebracht. Es wurde von den jugoslawischen Juden irgendwie organisiert. Jeden Tag dasselbe. Zweimal täglich Tee mit Schnaps, einmal mit Grün mit Kugel, abwechselnd mit verschiedenem Fleisch. Den Menschen kam es vor gut, ich hatte eine schwere Verunkulose im ganzen Körper aus Vitaminmangel.
Privatiken. Aus früher, aus ein bisschen Sonnenjahre. Inzwischen haben wir die Innenanwendung der Schiffe so ziemlich abmontiert. Alles, was zu verwerten war. Vorhänge, Volkskorrektor, Bezüge, Segelfieferkampf. Alles haben wir verarbeitet zu Sandalen, kurzen Boden und mehr. Okay, so um, the material that you've seen is edited for the occasion, uh, but it is uh, for my uh, PhD project, which is a practice research project on um, a very large group of Jewish refugees, counting about 1,200 people, um, who tried to escape the Nazis via the River Danube. But instead of reaching their goal, which was the Black Sea, they ended up in Serbia, nowadays Serbia. And eventually, after staying for more than two years, this is where the majority of the group was killed. So um, as part of my PhD, I'm writing about them, but I'm doing a film. So this is a project in the film department. Uh, and uh, the film, the idea of the film is to trace the locations where the group was staying or passing through along the, along the journey. Um, so this is one of the places, it is in Kladovo, and it is after this place in Serbia that the group was named, the Kladovo Transport. This is how it is known in history. Uh, interesting for me is uh, that, uh, well, uh, uh, Thomas and I worked together, we filmed together the location, we did together the research concerning this boat. So uh, my PhD needs to stay um, within this focus of the historical narrative of this Holocaust historical narrative of this group of Jewish refugees. But uh, we thought that this place and this ginormous object looks too brilliant. And the particular history or the biography of this particular object is incredible in its own right. So we thought that this would be actually a very good opportunity to um, talk about something that I can't do in my PhD. So this is not going to go in the PhD. So, and, and it's almost like, uh, 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 mentioning things that could further be developed and as you uh, mentioned at the beginning so very much uh, could be taken um, as you know within the context of politics of forgetting or what is chosen to remember or forget so I'll, I'll read out the the history of the subject um, so the uh, oh yeah uh, just to, uh, the name of the film is Two Emperors and the Queen. Uh, it refers to the name of this boat, which is San Nicolai II. There were two other boats, uh, one mm -hmm. Emperor Dushan, and the third one, Queen Maria. This is, uh, the first publication on this group is uh, Two Emperors and the Queen, which I'm borrowing for the film. Uh, so these are the photos from that time. So from these are the passengers, so a group of passengers. This is uh, the middle photo is uh, while they were in Kladovo. Uh, well, these two are when the group was in Kladovo. Uh, so, uh, but on the boat. Uh, so uh, what uh, also, the group spent on the boat a very long time. They were there for six months. They were living on board the boats for six months which I thought is an incredibly long period of time. Uh, but comparing to the very long um, particular biography of this boat, is almost an episode that could have uh, you know, passed unnoticed. OK, so uh, the boat, San Nicola II, was built in Germany and uh, was purchased in 1898 as the third passenger ship of the first Royal Serbian Privileged <coughs> Shipping Society or uh, better known as Serbian Shipping Society. It is 58 meters long, 6.8 uh, meter wide, and could take up to 700 passengers. 
before World War I, it was operating on the passenger line between Bel Belgrade and Radovac, the southernmost point of the Serbian stretch of the Danube. In 1915, during World War I, uh, the Serbian army, before uh, it started evacuating uh, to Corfu, uh, had sunk the boat. Subsequently, the Austro-Hungarian army refloated it and uh, tugged it upstream to the upper Danube. The history of the ship in the years following World War I is unclear. Uh, however, it was finally, when it was finally located and repaired, uh, it was refurbished and in uh, 23, 1923 it was returned to the ownership of the Serbian Shipping Society, which was now part of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, it's a, it's a different state, and put into traffic immediately. Uh, only three years later, in 1926, the Serbian Shipping Society was no longer allowed to use this uh, boat for the passenger traffic. The reason for this are not entirely clear, but it appears that the company lost its right to run passenger traffic. They thus decided to try, uh, to try, it, as, uh, try it out as a cargo ship, but without success, followed by equally unsuccessful attempts to either sell it or trade it for a better suited cargo vessel. Uh, so the boat San Nicola II thus remained moored near Belgrade without real purpose until the summer of 1933 when a small tourist company uh, started using it for short excursion trips around Belgrade, calling it Wandering Boat and Surprise Boat. And in October 1933, as a result of a business agreement between the Yugoslavian State River Shipping and the Serbian Shipping Society, Sir Nicholas II returns to its, legal, uh, to its original role and uh, is again transporting passengers. After the end, uh, so, uh, after the, the very beginning of World War II, the, the ship's history is marked by um, the journey of the class of transport, as I mentioned, which is the, uh, the, which is the story and the period that I'm exploring in my, in my PhD. And in doing so, there is all these other things that I'm sort of, um, I'm contributing towards forgetting everything else. But Thomas will take this point. Thanks. Yes. Uh, so I'll just continue with the, the, the post-war history of the of this particular ship and, and just to remind everybody so there were three ships involved in, in, in the story of the Kladovo transport on equal terms so the lift scattered those 1200 people over those three ships for a period of twelve month, uh, six months on the frozen Danube as, as, the, as one of the photographs showed until the ships were, had to be returned to the commercial purposes and, and the people had to that then live on, on barges and, and in, in a camp so just to bear that in mind, so this is the only one we have surviving. So this is the same ship, this is just two years after it was built, in 1900 in Belgrade. The same ship that we've been filming in the, in the shipyard of Kladovo. Um, in, so after, after the Kladovo transport, the ship was, the sh all three ships, but Tsar Nikola in particular was, was brought back into passenger traffic until World War II, which hadn't started in Yugoslavia until April 1941. So until 41, we don't know quite when the ship was actually operating as a regular passenger liner on the Danube. And then after the German occupation, the Germans sent the ship in 42 to Budapest, where it was used, it was re, re, reconstructed again into a cargo vessel, renamed um, Urfa, I think I have a slide actually, yes. So um, it, was, it was then rebranded as Urfa uh, and, and operated as a cargo vessel on, on, on the Danube, on, on, on the lower Danube. Um, until the end of the Second World War. Then after 1945, it was returned into Yugoslavian hands. Then obviously that was the Socialist Republic of uh, Yugoslavia and was changed back into a passenger boat and operated as a, as a liner between Belgrade and Prahovo, which is down, I can show you, literally down the very, uh, on the Bulgarian border essentially between, uh, between Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria here and, and, and Belgrade, which is here. And this is Kladovo, this big red dot here where the, where the Kladovo transport was stuck essentially for the winter of, of 1939-40. So it, it, it operated as a passenger liner until, um, until 65 under the name again of Split. So it was renamed, although there's a story and we, we're talking about the, the things people remember about Stonehenge, for example, early in the earlier session. In this case, there's a story that was propagated by a, a tabloid newspaper in, in, in Yugoslavia that it was briefly called Tito, probably every ship in Yugoslavia after the war is called Tito for a brief spell, and used as a floating brothel in Belgrade. But there's only that one tabloid newspaper. But it was definitely used until 65 
um, as, as a as a passenger ship when he was retired and replaced an older ship on the on the river Sava in Belgrade as a, as a floating restaurant and it was there then I split the floating restaurant in, into the early 1990s when he was finally um, moved from there and, and towed back down sort of by a stroke of irony in many ways back down to the shipyard in Kladovo where, where, the, where the people of the Kladovo's transport it's a complete coincidence but by, by the stroke of irony in 93, it was moved to Kladovo with the idea of, of restoring it back to its former glory and, and it was renamed back to its original name. So here you can see there is, sorry, there's split, you can read that, and then there's Tsar Nikolai written in Cyrillic, the second. So these are the, perfect. So these are the, 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 the names superimposed. You can see this, this renaming, this rebranding of, of, of the ship. However, as you can see, the refurbishment never happened. There's a, obviously, we, we could go into the politics of the, of, of the early 90s in the Balkans and directly linked, joined up with that rebranding and, and getting back to Tsar Nikolai. Um, we ha don't have time for this. But the, the important thing is there was a dispute probably about ownership and it never happened. So the ship sits there now for the last 25 years or so in, in, in the shipyard of Kladovol, rusting away on dry dock, which is the worst way to keep a ship, obviously, weathering away, disappearing which reminds us strongly of, of, of people like Rodney Harrison and others that have written about the link between heritage and waste. This is a perfect example. This is worthless as a ship. It will now refloat and, and it's falling apart. So it's, it's a piece of chunk sitting in a shipyard in the way, but it's also heritage for many people. And we would then take that argument further and say there's a link between heritage, waste and forgetting. Um, and the, the forgetting manifests itself in, in several different ways. For once, just out of interest, has anybody here heard of Kladovo Transport before? And interestingly, nobody uh, uh, anywhere else does. You know, this is not an important theme. I'm, I'm born in Vienna and 90% of these passengers were from Vienna. Silch, there's a book being published in the 90s, but nobody knows about Kladovo Transport. Few people in Serbia, but it's not a big story anywhere. So it's completely forgotten about as a as a story just remembered by the relatives of some of the survivors and some, some historians, essentially. Um, but also, those people who are interested in, in the Kladovo transport take this ship sort of almost as a type specimen. And therefore, everything else about the ship itself is doubly forgotten. That's not to do with Kladovo transport. It's almost like, as I say, this, this artifact that stands for the transport itself. And so everything else of this interesting history, this 130 years history of the ship is forgotten for these six months that it was used in this particular horrible and sad story. And even more so than the other two ships, Sardusha and Queen Maria, which were just as important for the transport and the failed transport. And because they have been scrapped in the meantime or sunk, they've disappeared. So therefore they are entirely written out almost. So there's this one artifact that, that sort of survived and therefore has become this type specimen, not just for Kladovo transport, but in many ways for Ali Abed, for the Jewish migration routes, especially the ones down the Dan to Danube, where it's sort of synonymous among specialists for that. And therefore all the other memories have been squeezed out uh, and, and forgotten about. And But the one interesting thing obviously is that we still have the artifact. We still have the boat sitting in the in, in, the Kladovo, in the Kladovo shipyard. And as long as that's the case, there's at least the opportunity for people like us to go back and do new things with it. And, and just very briefly, the voices that you heard, for example, are the memories of people who have survived. And the Vesa's film is entirely voiced with the voices of A, the survivors, and, and the correspondence of some of the people who have died as part of the journey, and, and other people to do with the, with the transport itself. So therefore, by, by reimagining this object, this artifact, in its current position and, and, and thinking about its role in, in the past, we have that opportunity. Once this has disappeared, obviously I think it will change again our memories of this particular period of history and this, this artifact will change. What, what will happen to it? We don't know, but I'm sure it's going to change. I think that's, that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much.